Anyway, uh, so the title of my talk is Check the Source. And uh, I, I want to share with you, first of all, a couple stories. I joined the Heartland Institute in 2001. And for the first several years, what I did was write. And the first time I stepped out into public speaking in a debate, this would have been probably 2006 or maybe 2007. And I was invited to Rutgers University. There were a couple legislators, one on each side of the issue, and they wanted to have a public forum, and they each got to invite one person up to, to speak with them. And so uh, a legislator in New Jersey invited me up, and uh, the other one invited Alan Robach, who is a professor at Rutgers. Uh, he also is high up the hierarchy with the American Geophysical Union. Now, I was flattered to be invited. I'd written much about this. I hadn't done public speaking debate on this. And I'm thinking, wow, my first debate on the topic, and I'm going up, ag I'm going up against this, this professor who's been published all over the place, everyone looks up to him, and I, I think I know my data really, really, really well. But I made it a point before that debate. I, every article, every peer-reviewed study that I knew was relevant that I'd be citing, I memorized the key passages. I knew the exact, quote, you know, the exact quotations, the citations. I had the data, I had it in front of me as well. I had a summary of all the studies that mattered, the data that mattered. And so I got there about an hour early, I didn't want to be late, I was the first one there. I hear a commotion as Alan Robach walks in the room. So I go up there and I extend my hand and, uh, and I say, Professor Robach, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm James Taylor. Held out my hand. He just looks at it like it's toxic goo. And he looks at me and says, I've never heard of the Heartland Institute. And I said, well, I'd be happy to uh, give you some information on it. We're a free market think tank and cuts me off. That is, I'd never heard of the Heartland Institute until today. And I looked at your website, and I was appalled at how you misrepresent science, you personally. And I said, well, I'm sorry that you feel that way. If I said, wrote something wrong, I'd be happy to correct it. Can you tell me specifically? And then he looks at me and says, do you even have a degree in science? And I said, well, I took quite a few atmospheric science courses, but my major was in government. I, maybe that's why I'm here with these legislative, you know, legislators, government officials. But if you think that's a pertinent point, by all means, bring it up in the debate. So we debated, and this is somebody who, after graduating from college, went right into the university field. So his whole life he has these students looking up to him, kissing his tail to get good grades. He's never had anybody challenge him, question him. So he spent the entire debate talking from his big brain about things he knew to be true. Didn't provide a single citation, a source, a reference, data. And I had all my facts laid out. And when he would give his talk, I would rebut them from the peer-reviewed literature from the actual raw data, which is even more authoritative than the peer-reviewed literature. And this went on throughout the debate, and you can see him getting more and more frustrated. And at the end, as I'm leaving, I hear him talking to the legislator who had invited him and others saying, it wasn't fair, it wasn't fair, he's not even a scientist. <laughs> That's Mike Tyson getting his butt kicked out in the alley and complaining that it wasn't a professional boxer that did it. Oh my God. <laughs> the point is, check the source, check the data, learn the data. You've got folks out there that are just making stuff up or talking what they know to be true, and they don't even have the facts. And, and, you know, I, would be, I would be presenting articles, studies, data. Clearly, he had no idea they existed. He's in his own little universe. I encountered the same thing. My next public debate was in Montana at the state legislature there, Steve Running, professor at the University of Montana Forestry. And throughout the debate, and again, once, once again, before the debate, and pleasure to meet you, shake your hand. I mean, I like people. I mean, we can disagree on the science, but I like people. So throughout the debate, he's presenting these slides. I remember one in particular. He shows this tremendous warming in Antarctica. I'm thinking, hmm, that seems odd to me. Tremendous ice melt in Antarctica. It's not what I've seen. And I look and he's got just in a fine print, he has like one station in West Antarctica, which if you've researched the data, you don't even have to research that deeply to know that what the West Antarctic Peninsula is an anomaly. The, the entirety of the Antarctic Peninsula is getting colder. You have the growth in sea ice, and you have a small section where it's getting warmer. So he presented that, deliberately misleading, mischaracterizing the evidence. And if you don't know the evidence, he gets away with it. He did the same thing about Greenland temperatures. It had been cooling for decades. There was a short, brief warming. So he starts his chart where the warming starts and ends it two years before our debate when the warming stopped. And he presents that and says, see, look, Greenland temperatures are getting warmer. And again, I have the data. And the point I'm making is this. When we have these debates, these discussions among your friends, colleagues, you name it, family members, the data, the science, they are on our side. And it's so important to know that. 
And, and the data that I have, that I presented, the peer-reviewed studies, they are all available. They're all freely available on the internet. You can find them. If you don't know where to go for primary sources, go to Anthony Watts' site, and he'll direct you to them. He summarizes them every day, and he points you directly to the site. This is how we win the debate. We have these folks, these eggheads that sit there that have never been in the real world, that think that because students kiss up to them, they never have to defend themselves, they never have to explain why they get their ideas, they never have to have give and take. But we in the skeptical community, we have to, because we're being attacked all the time for what we're saying. And that's where the science is being, is being refined, is being proven, and that's where we're winning. I'll give you a couple empirical examples. Two years ago, I think it was three years ago, the National Academy of Sciences, they produced what they called America's Climate Choices. And the media was in a frenzy. Here we have the National Academy of Sciences. All of these scientists throughout the nation, the world's leading scientists, have come out with this paper saying that humans are causing a global warming crisis. So it wasn't that hard to find the actual report. Anyone can find it. First thing I did is looked at who wrote it. I mean, I, I doubt whether every single member of the National Academy of Sciences wrote the paper. There were 23 people, 23, that's it. That's hardly representative of the National Academy of Sciences. I know scientists in the National Academy of Sciences who disagree with global warming alarmism. But I looked more closely at those 23. Only five of the 23 had a PhD in anything resembling climate science. I'm not talking they had to be climate science PhDs. I'm talking atmospheric science, anything that was you know, physics, physics, you name it. Only five of 23. An equal number, another five, we're staffers for environmental activist organizations. That's what the National Academy of Science has become. That's who they consult. That's who they contract with to write their articles. Two were politicians, active politicians, seeking office. One was the Clinton administration's general counsel for the EPA. And 19 of the 23, before being selected to write that paper, were already on record as vocal environmental activist global warming alarmists. That's not objective science. That's not a qualification for people that represent the scientific community. Nevertheless, even people that have their own agendas, that are politicians or whatever else, they can still present the science accurately, and we'll get to that in, in a few minutes. But it's important when people appeal to authority, which they always do in this debate. Now, scientists know appeals to authority mean nothing. It's the data. It's the facts that count. But we're fighting this, this battle sometimes in the realm of public opinion where people are going to say, I don't know the science. I'm going to trust authority. So look at that authority. The same thing this year for the Obama National Climate Assessment. I call it the Obama National Climate Assessment. The media just calls it the National Climate Assessment. But the Obama administration, after getting the report, had final say. They reviewed it. They sent it back for edits to make sure it matched their agenda. Folks that were the lead authors of this climate assessment, again, you had a very small number of authors, included folks from the Union of Concerned Scientists, Planet Forward, Second Nature, and the Nature Conservancy. You know, Heartland Institute's never invited. I mean, I'd love to be part of this. National Academy of Sciences, National Climate Assessment. I think we're at least as good as the Nature Conservancy. I mean, I hope so. But once again, when the, when in the public sphere, when the media talks about this is the most authoritative assessment from the world's top scientists, no, it's not. Check the facts. Check the sources. Check the data. It's available to all of us. Looking more specifically at data, Hurricane Sandy. I remember almost vomiting when watching Fox News and Shepard Smith, as Sandy's reaching, you know, approaching New Jersey, says, folks, you can say whatever you want, but we never used to have storms like this. You know, the implicit message is it's global warming. Well, Shepard Smith, I don't know, how old would you say Shep is? 50, yes, okay. So, you know, so he's born in about, you know, 1964. His you know, memory goes back to the early 70s. We never used to have storms like this. Well, I went to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration website, and I called up data for hurricanes striking on the East Coast, and I looked specifically at Category 3 through 5. Hurricane Sandy, it was technically not a hurricane when it came ashore. It had been. It had winds that were Category 1 strength. Category 1. Category 1. So I went back to NOAA and looked at Category 3 or higher hurricanes, if you want to see what real, real, real damaging storms are. The last one that had run up through the area was Hurricane Gloria in 1986. Before that, when you want to see a spate of these hurricanes, they were in the first half of the 20th century, before all this global warming. The reason why, to Shepard Smith, these things never used to occur is because they have not occurred in his lifetime, which is the past 30, 40 years, as the planet has warmed. 
So he makes it seem like because he hadn't remembered it, it must be global warming causing this. But when these happened all the time, and much more powerfully, was back 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. The facts were available for everybody. So I'll write about it on Forbes or wherever else, and people think I'm brilliant. I'm not. I'm just calling attention to the data that's there for everybody to see. Same thing with wildfires. People talk about, sometimes they'll talk about the number of acres burned and how it's so much higher than it used to be. But if you look at the number of wildfires, they're actually declining. Hmm, that seems kind of odd. Less wildfires, more acres burned. Is it global warming? No, it's federal forestry policy. They used to put out every fire they could find as soon as they found it. Now they say we did that and, and the forest became unnaturally thick. They're diseased, we have bark beetles. We need to let fires burn until and unless they threaten civilization, till they threaten homes, etc. So you have fewer wildfires, they burn more because of human decisions that have nothing to do with climate. The important part about whether we're having more wildfires or not, those numbers are going down. Same thing with crop production. We hear all the time about how global warming is going to threaten rice, corn, wheat production around the world. Well, if you go look at the USDA's website or GeoHive, they're a, they, they have a website that produces global crop data. You will see that over the past 30, 40 years, crop production in the United States per acre, gross production throughout the world has escalated, doubled, tripled in that time. Now, there are many factors involved. But if global warming is killing crop production, you would see that. Just the opposite, we see longer growing seasons, seasons more precipitation, you name it, you know, fewer, frost, fewer frost days. This is leading to an enhancement in crop production, and yet the media tells us that we're seeing less of it. If you check the sources, if you check the data, you don't have to be Alan Robach, who's living in the ivory tower, who's never had his theories challenged. You don't have to be Stephen Running. You, me, real scientists should be doing this all the time. Check the sources, and that's where you'll find your data. So let me just conclude with this. Norm mentioned that I am a, an attorney by training. I went to law school, got, got my JD, but didn't want to do that. But I did find something very important there, and that is how many here, actually I would say how many have. How many have not seen the movie My Cousin Vinny? So, okay. My Cousin Vinny, hilarious movie, Joe Pesci. Basically, a New York attorney goes on to Alabama and he's, he's just a, he's never amounted to anything, but he solves this case and gets his clients, his cousin, off the hook. But there's a scene in there where he talks about, his cousin says, you were, I remember when you were at the, uh, the magic show, Alakazam, and he's doing all these tricks, but he was like, He's palming it, and he's got this thing hidden under there on a string. And basically, he had the ability to look at what people were saying and claiming, understand what was really going on, and call them on it. That is what my legal training, I'm proud of it, because it has taught me to look at things like that. If you're going to win a case like my cousin Vinny, you have to look under the scenes. You have to look under the hood. And what we see in the alarmist argument is that there is nothing under the hood. There is no engine. But you don't have to be a lawyer, you don't have to be a scientist to figure it out, just check the source. Thank you very much.